Hi, everyone. It's really good to see all of your actual faces. I'm so tired of Zoom, and it's really nice to have the energy coming from the room and actually being able to be here um, with you all today. So I'm Mary. I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of the COTS Control Innovation Program, which is um, one of the components of the Reef Trust Partnership. Hi. Um, so let's see. Big green button. There we go. So. Sheridan and David have already really introduced this well and set the scene, but of course, um, COTS outbreaks are one of the major threats to the health of the Great Barrier Reef. And from a management perspective, um, you know, COTS control is one of the most scalable and feasible options we have to, uh, available today to enhance the reef's resilience in the face of climate change. And as Sheridan uh, described, that integrated pest management approach developed under NESP has been really pivotal in making the COTS control program what it is today, um, which is really the reef's largest on-ground program aimed at directly protecting coral, uh, and one that's achieving significant outcomes that you'll hear about through the course of this forum. Um, so we've come a long way over the past five or six years, and just like Dave um, has, was just saying, I think it's important to reflect on that and, and really think about that because really that makes me really inspired about what we can collectively do um, in the years ahead through ongoing focus on research investment to tackle this threat. So with that context in mind, the Reef Trust Partnership is investing $57.8 million to continue building momentum and capacity to address the COTS threat. Um, their strategic priorities in funding the in-water in control program and driving towards f further efficiency there, leading a step change in innovation and outbreak detection, and exploring the feasibility of alternative control methods. And I know Teresa had already touched on these things, um, but we're achieving that through a, oh, sorry, achieving that through a number of um, activities through the Reef Trust COTS component. First of all, we're funding the ongoing delivery of the COTS control program, um, which we're doing in partnership with uh, Grabumpa and RRRC, and you'll hear lots of great talks about that program in the next session, uh, including a talk by Professor Chad Hewitt, who will tell us about the findings of an independent scientific review of the program. Uh, we're also funding this innovation program, which I'll tell you about now. We're also investing in traditional training and capacity building, um, and you'll hear about more about that during the forum. Um, and we're also looking at bringing, engaging community and citizen scientists in uh, control and surveillance. And finally, we're investing in forums like this, where we all get to come together, um, share our knowledge from across diverse um, uh, disciplines, build networks, and look for ways to better collaborate. So um, now focusing in on the COTS Control Innovation Program, which um, I'm calling CSIP, or we're calling CSIP, so that's another acronym to add to your long list. Um, the mission here is to create a step change and accelerate the development of innovative, uh, development and uptake of innovative methods that improve COTS surveillance and control. And we're delivering this research program as a collaborative partnership between the foundation, Ames, JCU, CSIRO, and UQ. And we have a budget of 9.8 million from the RTP plus additional co-contributions from our partners. Um, and the program is being delivered over four years across um, two phases. So phase one is the feasibility and design phase, which we're smack dab in the middle of now, where we're assessing the feasibility and benefit costs and risks of a bunch of potential research innovations and using a systematic framework to um, guide our research investment. And then phase two will be um, the R&D phase, which will kick off um, next financial year, where we'll, we'll implement the outcomes of that uh, design phase, deliver research outcomes, and throughout that time work closely with um, managers, end users, and the on-water control program to identify pathways to trial and integrate those innovations in the control program. 
So the CSIP is governed by a steering committee that oversees the design, progress, and delivery of the program, and that's chaired by GBRF with members from all partner research institutions, um, as well as RRRC as the key link to NESP, and also representatives from the department, Grabumpa, and the tourism industry. And we're also seeking uh, a traditional owner member to join our committee. So um, the call will be open from Wednesday, this Wednesday, the 31st of March, and will close on Monday the 19th. Um, so details will be on our website, our LinkedIn page, sent out through the Reef Network newsletter and through our traditional owner advisory group mailing lists. So if you're interested or want to know more about that opportunity, please come chat to me over the next couple of days um, or send me an email. So, in the CSIP design phase, we're using a structured decision-making process um, to inform our investment decisions. So this is a common approach used across sustainability, conservation, and environmental management settings. And uh, this quote here on the screen is from one of the key texts by Gregory et al. Um, but uh, many of you might also know that the um, CEO of Ames, Paul Hardesty, has also written a book, book on the subject, which you may have read. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or not, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> Um, so the, this, this process is an organized approach to identify and evaluate creative options and make choices in complex decision situations. And so it's designed to engage stakeholders, uh, technical experts, and decision makers in a process that's analytical and deliberative using best practice in decision science. And there's a usual common framework. Um, here's an example from the USGS. Um, and typical steps to this process. And this, this kind of decision process is usually um, really useful, especially in situations where the stakes are high and there's a fair degree of uncertainty um, in which path to choose. And that's certainly the case here. Uh, it's a high stakes decision for the health of the Great Barrier Reef. Um, given we're in the midst of uh, battling a current outbreak of crown of thorn starfish, and we expect another one to kick off probably around 2025, right, um, right on the reef outside our, our doorstep here in Cairns. Um, and all of this, as Dave is saying, um, is against a backdrop of increasing disturbances. So it's important that we take a really considered approach in deciding how we invest in research to tackle this threat. And so that's what we're doing today or over the course of this year. So in the design phase of this program, we've engaged 43 multidisciplinary experts, many of which are in the room today, um, our steering committee, and also four external assessors in a structured decision-making process. And we have identified six research themes or program areas that are relevant to driving innovation and COTS, COTS management. They're listed on the in the blue boxes there on the screen, and so these are COTS bio and ecology research to better build an understanding of the pest we're managing, research focused on the proximal causes of outbreaks, um, methods for improving current control methods and delivering new methods of population control, tools and strategies for monitoring and surveillance of outbreaks, decision support and modeling to underpin our strategic and tactical response to outbreaks, and also better understanding of the social, cultural, and regulatory perspectives that under, underpin our management. So with that collection of brilliant minds involved, um, we've been undertaking six steps. We're, we're um, through step five now, and I'll just over, give you an overview of those now. Um, so as a starting point, each of those expert teams did a gap analysis to identify research needs to drive towards innovation um, in their theme. Uh, and then based on that gap analysis, the teams developed research opportunities to fill those gaps and collected information on the benefits, costs, and risks of those opportunities. And that step generated 52 research opportunities that are essentially the building blocks of our research program. 
The expert teams then assess those opportunities in their program areas using a standard evaluation criteria through an online survey followed by a workshop to review and discuss those outcomes. Um, and that generated really rich data for us on the consequences of trade-offs of those opportunities from each program area that we used in constructing portfolio options. And that process in, in terms of um, step four, um, developing those um, research portfolio options, um, we held a workshop to consult with uh, CSIP decision makers and external stakeholders on their values. And the outcome of that was um, the construction of seven different portfolio themes. Um, and then th those technical experts, decision makers, and external assessors assess those portfolio options using an online survey. And Myself and a few others have been busily analyzing those results over the past few days um, in prep for a workshop that we're holding on Wednesday, which will kick off um, the final step in this process where we align on the portfolio strategy and optimize its content so we can provide a recommendation. So now I'll just give you an overview of um, each of the program areas. Um, you'll get a bit more detail on that later on this afternoon. Um, but just to give you a flavor for the kinds of research opportunities that are on the table to build this research program, um, I'll go through each of the program areas in turn. Um, and the first one is biology and ecology. That expert team has been led by Morgan Pratchett. Uh, and they undertook a systematic identification of the fundamental gaps in knowledge, which are affect our ability to predict, detect, and control outbreaks. That team generated eight research um, uh, opportunities that fill no knowledge gaps in larval biology, juvenile ecology and settlement patterns, methods to age cots, um, understand their feeding rates and impacts on coral communities, and understand their patterns of abundance pre-outbreak, particularly in the initiation zone. So a lot of fundamental gaps in knowledge. The Proximal Causes Program Area team um, was led or is led by Sven Utica, um, and they conducted a gap analysis of the conditions, processes, and mechanisms that influence the currents and frequency of outbreaks. And they generated 12 research opportunities um, that seek to fill knowledge gaps in our understanding of the links between water quality and outbreaks, the role of benthic and fish predators in mitigating outbreaks, the effects of climate change on cots and outbreak dynamics, um, effects are the natural aspects of boom and bust population cycles, and models that explore the interrelationships between multiple outbreak causes. Sorry. Sorry, Sven. <laughs> There's yours. All right. The population control team, um, led by Frederica Kroon, um, if she's still in the room. Um, oh, there you are. Hi. Um, um, that program area considered innovations in the um, methods we use to control outbreaks, either um, advancing the current methods and also exploring novel control methods. Um, and their team came up with seven research opportunities that develop capability and use understanding the role of zoning in controlling outbreaks. That, um, that was something that Sheridan had flagged earlier. Development of semi-chemical approaches to attract or deter COTS as part of an outbreak integrated pest management strategy. Um, development of genetic methods to control COTS, uh, including things like creation of sterile males and disrupting spawning aggregations, um, and exploring symbionts as a delivery mechanism for those uh, genetic, genetic control methods, and finally, the use of uh, tritons as a biocontrol agent. Let's see. The monitoring and surveillance team led by David Westcott um, has done an assessment of the existing and emerging technologies and systems for enhancing COTS detection to um, support outbreak response. Their team uh, developed 10 research opportunities that focus on designing uh, a monitoring program uh, using a suite of 
uh, different tools to detect COTS and inform response, development of image-based tools um, for COTS surveillance and analysis of the, that imagery using machine learning, um, development of eDNA tools to monitor both larval and adult COTS and also the reef communities and context in which um, outbreaks occur, and also tools for underwater logging of coal uh, dive data. The decision support and modeling team led by um, Cameron Fletcher um, is focused on delivering innovations that connect the science and monitoring delivered or as part of CSIP with the decision makers and on water crew. Um, that team generated 10 research opportunities that develop capacity in both the reef and regional scale modeling that underpins our tactical and strategic decision making uh, in the control program an infrastructure that build, brings together the field data, models, and decision support into a central hub, and improvements in the on-water decision support system to incorporate the innovations and learnings gained through CSIP research, including things like early warning tools. The last program area, um, and not certainly not the least, is the social acceptability, regulatory, and institutional arrangements program area. It's a big mouthful, so we'll just call it the social science team, uh, led by Aditi Mankad. I don't think Aditi managed to make it here today from Brisbane, um, but her team developed five research opportunities that build capacity in um, understanding um, the public and stakeholder perspectives and social license for existing and novel um, control methods, traditional owner perspectives and involvement in COTS control and research and management, um, po the policy and regulatory environment for existing and novel control methods, and also estimation of the economic benefits of COTS management. So those are the six program area teams, and I just want to thank all of you, um, particularly the program area leads, but the rest of you in the rooms for generating that really um, fantastic body of research and knowledge um, to consider in designing this program. So after generating those 52 research opportunities, each of the expert teams assessed them against eight evaluation criteria to generate data on their offerings in terms of their path to impact, um, ability to suppress uh, and prevent outbreaks, their offerings in terms of ecosystem health and socioeconomic co-benefits, their time to viability, risks, um, synergies, and innovation potential. And so that allowed us to rank the opportunities um, uh, across each criteria and understand their relative uh, consequences and trade-offs. So for example, in the green line here, you can see um, this opportunity in particular offered really strong ability to suppress or prevent outbreaks and also a really strong opportunity to um, de de deliver innovation potential. But in contrast, it, the trade-off is that it's one of the most risky opportunities of the bunch and also will take quite a long time to become viable, so 10 to 20 years before it can be used in a management context. In contrast, opportunities like this one in the dark blue line have a really clear direct path to impact to be used in control, um, and, but in contrast have really low innovation potential as, con as um, uh, considered by the expert assessment panel. So you can see that gave us some information that we're really using as we go into building the portfolio and designing the program. So we then use that data in constructing research portfolio options. And um, we constructed portfolios across seven different themes. So one, one way we could approach this is um, building a research program that uh, uh, has an emphasis on delivering innovations in the very short term to enhance the management of the current outbreak. Um, so there's one portfolio option there that, that focuses on that. Um, there's another one that has an emphasis on delivering innovations that will help us suppress the 2025 outbreak, so medium term, um, and one with an emphasis on innovations that will help us understand and prevent future primary outbreaks in the longer term. A fourth um, portfolio emphasis involved improving our knowledge and systems understanding, both from an ecological and social perspective. Um, 
um, a fifth option involved um, so really focusing in on developing technologies for new novel control methods, including the underpinning ecological and social understanding. A sixth option we could take is emphasizing R&D that focuses on informing long-term strategy and decision-making. Um, and the final portfolio could focus on maximizing synergies between um, the, the research in CSIP and also other research programs. So that heat map gives you an idea of um, how different opportunities align to each of those portfolios. Some opportunities are well aligned to across all the portfolios. Some really speak to delivering outcomes for a particular portfolio or another. So you can kind of see the heat map there. Um, and so. Over the past few weeks, the experts, um, steering committee and external assessors have been evaluating those portfolios using an online survey, and we're about to um, reflect on those results on Wednesday. And they, they used this little survey tool online in order to do that. So next steps. Um, now that we're zeroing in on our final program design, we're really seeking your input. So the broader input of the stakeholder community. Um, and so we have a panel discussion this afternoon at um, 425, where the team leads will talk you through their research team's opportunities, and you'll have a chance to ask questions, understand better, and provide feedback. Um, we'll take that information into the workshop we're having on Wednesday, where we'll review the outcomes of the assessment the portfolio level assessment. And then following that workshop, we'll be optimizing that final program design um, and doing some more detailed program planning in order to deliver our recommendations ahead of next financial year. So that's where we're at with CSIP design. Um, I, yeah, again, I just want to thank and give a special shout out to the team leads and all the expert technical teams who've been involved in this design phase. Um, you've done a fantastic job in developing the kinds of solutions that we will take forward with us to tackle this threat over the next three years. So thanks, everyone.